Hello, welcome to the third lecture of ECE 113. In this top, in this lecture, we will be talking about nonlinear distortion. Before we go there, what is distortion? Distortion is the alteration or deformation of a waveform due to the processing stages. It's not just the channel that introduces distortion in a signal. It's also the building blocks of your communication system. And two examples would be your nonlinear distortion and your linear distortion. Your two types. The linear distortion part deforms the signal through the phase response. And it's band-limited frequency distortion. Example, in this figure, your square wave is filtered out by an RC filter, creating a salt, somewhat a sawtooth of sawtooth, excuse me, somewhat a sawtooth waveform okay because of this your waveform does not follow completely your square wave because the high frequency components are filtered out by your low pass filter that means a deformation of the wave that you're trying to transmit arises because of this band limited frequency response another is your phase distortion the phase distortion arises from your nonlinear phase response. For example, your triangle wave, when passed through a filter, in this case, it's a Butterworth filter with a high order, some of its components are delayed with a significant increase in phase difference than the other frequency components resulting in an imperfect output waveform something like this from your sharp edges your triangle wave becomes uh, less sharp at some points example here 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 so this is a form of your phase distortion the phase distortion actually comes from your group delay the group delay is a collective time delay of the amplitude envelope of a signal. In this case, for your triangle wave, it's your, well, basically the triangle parts. If the, uh, linear, the phase response is linear, the group delay is constant, meaning there is no distortion in the amplitude envelope of the signal. These, abortion, sorry, <clears throat> these distortions can be averted okay, if equalizers are used. Since they are linear distortion in frequency, we can always just cancel them. Okay, so now let's look at the nonlinear behavior of our devices. First, let's look at the noise. As pre as uh, Discussed in the previous lecture, as we have talked about, because of noise, there's a minimum signal that we can detect. Okay, minimum signal we can detect. So you can measure that by not letting any input enter your receiver and then measure the power at the output. This is your noise floor. Anything, any signal less than that, any signal power less than your noise floor becomes drowned in noise and you won't be able to detect it. Example, let's look at a Wi-Fi receiver. Let's say the Wi-Fi receiver consists of a low noise amplifier connected to a mixer and then connected to, well, just a low noise amplifier, then a mixer. Given their gains and their noise figures if our receiving antenna is kept at 290 kelvin what is the noise power the wi-fi bandwidth is 27 megahertz first things first you need to solve for the total noise figure of your system and you'll get this equation uh, this value right here and with that it's equivalent noise temperature which is this the total noise at the output is equal to 20 times the logarithm of the gains times k multiplied to the temperature times b 
this KTB right here represents the total noise that enters the system with the added noise due to the linear components. And the output noise is this value right here. So if we have a very low input signal power, the noise dominates. We won't be able to detect the signal because of that. If in our systems with a gain G has an output noise N sub O or N sub zero, the power output can now be modeled as such. If the input power is less than the noise, divided by the gain, of course, the output is the noise. If the input power is greater than the noise, then it follows a linear gain function. Okay. Basically, the output power is just the gain multiplied to the input power. And this, uh, this behavior is actually some form of non-linearity in, in the device. That it's not caused by the device, rather it is caused by the noise. So this is a cause of distortion. Very weak signals are distorted by noise. That's why it's imperative to maintain a certain SNR value at the input. So in terms of uh, graphing it, it looks something like this. And then the minimum detectable signal becomes this value. So I've shown this to you before. Okay. Now what happens if the opposite occurs? We have a very large in output, uh, sorry, input power. What would happen to the output? Let's look at our active devices. Our active devices are the reason why we have gain in the first place. However, these active devices provide a nonlinear response. Okay, for example, our diode, BJT, and MOSFETs. This is the equation of the relationship, rather, of the current to the voltage. Okay. <clears throat> So what is the effect of these active devices on our signal power? Before we go there, let's look let's review a concept, the Taylor series. Given a continuous function f of x and all of its differential functions exist, it can be written by its derivatives. Okay? Basically, it's just this equation right here. So f of x here is the summation of this equation right, with some parameter a. Normally, a is 0. That's our Maclaurin series. So let's apply that to the diode equation. So if x is this fraction, the voltage difference or the voltage across the diode divided by vt, so e to the x minus 1 becomes this, if we use the Taylor series, excuse me, at x is equal to 0, at a is equal to 0, rather, and we get, we substitute x back, we have this equation for the diode current. So as you can see, the diode current is a function of the powers of Vd over Vt. In general, if you have a nonlinear device, or an this case an amplifier, the voltage output is defined by the transfer function as you see right here. If we have a sinusoidal input, then the output becomes this equation right here. Okay? So it seems that, so wait, just recall that this square right here creates a frequency term of 2 omega sub 0. This cube right here creates a term of 3 omega sub 0, and so on and so forth. Basically, if you have a pure sinusoidal input, what happens to the output is that some components of the frequency actually appear in the output that distorts the original input signal. Okay? 
And these higher frequency components disappear if the factors A2, A3, and so on is much, much less than A0 and A1. Okay? So, for example, in the diode, as you can see, if VD is uh, very small, right here, these terms will become approximately 0. Okay. Now, if we break this equation down, convert them to trigonomic, uh, trigonometric terms to have no power, we see a waveform that is defined by a Fourier series. So recall what a Fourier series is. So uh, this is the output for your uh, fundamental frequency. The fundamental frequency has an amplitude that is dependent on the input amplitude. Okay? And we actually want this uh, function right here. Why? Because we want the input to have the same frequency content as the output. All the others will just be filtered out. But as we, you recall for our amplifiers, we want the response of the amplifier to be linear. What does that mean? Basically, the gain is equal, sorry, the output power is equal to some gain times P sub I. And this gain should not be dependent on the input power. It should be a constant over all input powers. But if apparently, if we look at a general amplifier, a nonlinear device, our output actually is dependent on the input power, which is dependent on the amplitude of the input v naught. Okay, so the gain actually is equal to this equation right here. The gain basically is dependent on the amplitude of the input. And usually, this a sub 3 right here has an opposite sign compared to a1. So let's convert that to decibel. Okay, so converting that to decibel, P0 becomes this. Okay, and we substitute the gain. We have this equation. If A1 is much, much greater than A3, then this becomes 0. And we're left with this equation right here. At this point, when A1 is much, much greater than A3 V0 squared, this is the point when your amplifier is linear. Otherwise, in high values of V0, which correlates to high power, your gain is actually reduced. And we call this the gain compression or the saturation. This is actually what happens when you have, uh, when you uh, increase the input too much, your gain actually is compressed compared to what you expect. What you expect is this straight line, but at some point, the actual gain is compressed, and to characterize that, we use what we call the 1 dB compression point, or P 1 dB. Okay. It's basically the power input at which the output power is reduced by 1 dB. Quite simply, that 1 dB compression point is defined by this equation. So if you're given OP 1 dB, you should be able to get the input, the maximum input power before the gain compression begins. Okay. And from there, we can now define the dynamic range of the amplifier. The minimum input power should be greater than the noise floor. And the maximum input power should be less than the compression. 
Otherwise, your uh, device will compress the gain, creating nonlinear distortion. So that range will just be the 1 dB point of the input minus the minimum detectable signal. Now let's look at another type of uh, distortion. We have harmonic distortion. So I said this earlier, when you're looking at a general amplifier, which is which is a nonlinear device, it creates components when a sinusoid is uh, the input. Okay. So if we look at until the second component on only second power, we actually create this output, your desired frequency, and some second harmonic that you don't want. Okay, and this is your harmonic distortion. So this results in the presence of higher order harmonics, but this is actually useful in some cases like mixers and frequency multipliers, but generally unwanted in amplifiers. Of course, we want to maintain the frequency content of the signal. That means we only need the fundamental frequency component. So all of these should be filtered out. If it can't be filtered out completely, of course, but we can measure what we call a total harmonic distortion as a parameter, and at some value less than your threshold, we can say that your signal is pure and void of harmonic distortion. And basically, that is just equal to right, getting the square root of V1, which is the magnitude or the amplitude of your fundamental frequency, divided by the sum of the magnitudes of your, or amplitudes of your other components. Okay, and that's just for harmonic distortion. Now, let's look at the case when we have the sum of two tones. Of course, uh, in the previous derivations and examples of nonlinear distortion, we only considered the uh, input to be a pure sinusoid, sinusoidal wave. What if we have a signal that has some bandwidth? It contains frequencies within a bandwidth. How do you characterize a distortion? So let's say the input, without loss of general, generality, let's just use two sinusoids with differing frequencies, but the frequencies are close together. Okay, recall that for the Taylor series, the output voltage is a function of the powers of the input voltage. Substitute that for our two-tone, so we had this and this. We expand all that, we get this, this, and this. So you don't need to worry about that much. The math about, you don't need to worry about the math, not as much. Okay, and if we expand it to have no powers, uh, we have this, your fundamental components, and some other components right here. And the others are negligible at very small V0. Okay. In between these negligible components and the fundamental components are non-negligible distortions. These are all of this, basically. And this actually give ri gives rise to what we call intermodulation distortion. Basically, some frequencies arise due to the awaited sum or difference of your frequency components. The order of your intermodulation distortion is defined by basically the sum of the magnitudes of some integers m and n. The output spectrum of your uh, intermodulation distortion is basically a weighted sum or difference of your two frequencies. Right? In the previous equation, these are your second order products. The third order products are these, and these are actually the important ones. 
So, if you look at the frequency spectrum of two sinusoid, uh, the sum of two sinusoids that is input to an amplifier, okay, we get these other frequency components, your original uh, fundamental components right here. Oops, let me just redraw that. Your fundamental components are right here. But very near them are your third order products. And they cannot be easily filtered out. So the others can be filtered out. This can disappear. This can disappear. The ones close to your original signal, uh, you can't really filter that out. Well, you can, but the filter needs to be designed. The filter that needs to be designed is complex. So it's difficult to filter them out. So uh, you, you just need to be able to live with it by minimizing it, right? So you have to minimizing it, might minimize this uh, signal. How? Let's characterize it first. To characterize your intermodulation distortion, we use what we call the third order intercept point or IP3. So we'll only consider the fundamental components and the third order components, right? So it's this one and this one. So uh, this is the output after filtering the spear signals. The expected power output is this, okay? Take note that the input power is V naught squared over two the actual output power is this. Where did this come from? It's the power of this equation right here, which is just the sum of this, the power of this, plus the power of this, plus the power of this, and the power of this. We get this equation right here. Okay? So the actual power is equal to some gain times the input power plus this third order gain g3 times the input power cubed okay which is the expected power plus the power added due to your intermodulation distortion okay if we convert this in dv D, dv sorry if we convert this in db then the expected output power is just your input power plus the gain this is your linear region the third order power is equal to 3 times your uh, input power plus the third order gain. And as you can see here, in terms of dB, the slope of this input power is actually higher. So if we put them in a graph, the linear response with slope equal to 1, which is what we want, is this line right here. The IM3 power, or the third order power, has a slope of 3, so it rises faster compared to your uh, expected output power. And then so at some point, they will intercept with e intersect with each other, rather. And that intersection point is the IP3. And the best uh or a rule of thumb is once you have determined the IP3, you want to operate uh, one or two decades before that IP3. Okay? So that means uh, you need to operate around 20 dBm less, or maybe 10, 10 dBm is enough. 10, excuse me, 10, B, 10 dBm less than that that's already a good operating point that minimizes the, I, uh, the intermodulation distortion. So as I've said, the intermodulation distortion, you just need to be able to live with it. Uh, you can only minimize it by operating at a certain point. Okay. So to compute for this third order intercept point, it just means that when they intersect, 
that's where you get your third order intercept point. So just equate the expected output power with the third order power. So at that point, your expected output power becomes OIP3 and your, ex your input power is IIP3. So it's this equation and to solve for IIP3, main, uh, basically you just get this value right here. Two-thirds of the first order weight divided by the third order weight. Okay? And some important parameter is this VIP3 it, you will see later. Okay? The theoretical output power at this point is just you multiply the gain, the linear gain, order the first order gain with IIP3 and it's approximately equal to this. That's the theoretical output power. Just emphasis on the theoretical is, uh, due to gain compression, it's reaching that point is actually impossible. So now let's define your spurious free dynamic range. This is the range of input power where the effect of IM3 is negligible. And it's equal to two-thirds the distance between your OIP3 and your noise. So basically, you just need to get the distance of this OIP3 with the noise floor somewhere here and get the two-thirds of that, then you operate within that region, then your, uh, you operate within that region, then your uh, output is distortionless. Well, approximately distortionless. So now, what if we cascade nonlinear devices? What would happen to the OIP3 at the output? What is the total OIP3 of this equation right here? Okay, so recall that your IM3 power is equal to this value right here. It's actually, it came from this, 9 fourths, and we just substituted the voltage input. So we, be ha we have this equation right here. And uh, just some mathematical manipulation, we actually see a relationship between your input power and OIP3. So we get your input power cube, this is this one, divided by the OIP3 squared. Okay. The V, the voltage at IM3, which is the output, is equal to the square root of the sum power times Z0. Where did this come from? Recall that V squared over Z0 is equal to the power. Okay. So we have this equation right here. And we substitute your uh, PIM3 to, to this equation. And we have this final equation right here. Okay. Uh, where will you use this? Well, this is the voltage at this point. Okay. And because it's the voltage at this point, it will enter this nonlinear device which has an OIP3 of itself. And it will be boosted by this gain, G2, resulting in some VIM3 and PIM3. And at the worst case scenario, the VIM3 becomes this expression right here. So this is the worst case scenario at the second stage. Each component is this. First is the distortion from the first stage amplified. And the next one is the distortion generated by your second stage. Okay. Knowing that PI prime, uh, PI prime prime is this gain of the second stage multiplied by the input power at the second stage. Okay. You can now define OI, the OIP3, the total OIP3 would be equal to the power at the input cube multiplied by some Z0 divided by your total OIP3. Right. Writing the equation for VIIM3 prime prime. From the previous equation, we get this final expression right here. And uh, equate this with this. The OIP3 is equal to what is inside. So we have this equation for OIP3. So just to recap, then, for your cascaded nonlinear device, 
your OIP3 is basically some parallel connection between the two OIP3s of your cascaded devices. The SFDR still remains the same. Just some notes. Your total OIP3 reduces over increasing number of nonlinear stages. And less OIP3 means reduced spurious free dynamic range. So this is a consequence of connecting more and more devices in your system. Your OIP3 re is reduced. Therefore, your operating uh, power is also reduced. Okay? So we want to minimize the amount of active devices that we use or the amount of systems with uh, the amount of amplifiers that we use in a system okay? also mixers mixers are also non-linear non devices and we'll see that in the next lecture these are the references and that's the end of the lecture if you have any questions feel free to leave a comment in the comment section below thank you for listening i'll see you next meeting